Yo, dude, what up? Hey, man. How's How you going? It's, it's going pretty good. How you doing? Uh, just had a couple of losses again. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's not my week, <laughs> I guess. It sucks. Uh, don't worry, yeah. dude. We're gonna we're gonna help you increase that. So we're gonna turn it around. Okay. We're gonna give you tons and tons of wins. We got this. Good. Good. Uh, nice. So. Refresh. I sorry. I I'm sure I probably asked the same thing last time. But are we we are doing this on the European server, right? Yep. Okay. I'm logging over to Europe. But yeah. So you were telling me like your win rate against uh, what was it? Terran is like, like really 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 low nowadays. Yep. Uh, it's <laughs> like maybe thirty losses to ten wins or something like that in the yeah. current season. Don't worry, man. We got you covered. We're gonna fix that. Okay, uh, so before we begin, I have some questions. Sure. Just random questions that I don't know the answer of. Okay. Uh, okay, so you show in your stream and in your videos how to defend the cannon rush, and that's okay, but what to do afterwards because I'm left with a lot of economic disadvantage. So and the other, the other guy is doing like a sky toss or a gateway proxy with zealots, zealots close to my base, and I'm not sure what to do because I always lose after the cannon rush. Uh, so what I would recommend you do is you have an overlord near the cannon rush to see because you should always see two things. Okay, you should see his natural with your first overlord, and you should be able to see is he going to expand behind this. And if the answer is no, you should also see what he's going to make at your base. If there's going to then be proxied production, like if it's going to be a robo or if it's going to be gateway. If it is proxy production, you need to keep making ravagers. And I would honestly recommend to keep making queens in your main base so that you can just always have enough to like you might lose a couple here and there to like stalker or immortal. But you're going to ideally be able to, uh, you know, overpower what's at your base. Um, I do always recommend also canceling your hatchery and rotating it somewhere else. So it's like literally, kind of, it almost becomes like a proxy hatch at a different mineral line. That base makes drones, drones, drones. You just keep making drones. Uh, what if what if the guy follows me with his probe? You, that's why you always follow. So here's how it goes. Okay, there's uh, three overlords are important here. First overlord always goes to his natural. Second overlord immediately goes to your natural. And then as soon as you realize, oh shit, yep, I'm getting cannon rushed, like as soon as it's confirmed and you, you're going to now cancel the hatchery, that second overlord goes to where your next hatchery is going to go. You follow the drone with overlord number two. So you can see if he's going to put some ninja cannon rush at it. And if he does, if here's the thing, if he keeps cannon rushing all of your hatcheries, it makes it that much easier and that much easier and that much easier to kill his proxy with your ravagers, his initial cannon rush at your, at your main base. Uh... So, as soon as you break out, your Ravagers can just kill cannons indefinitely. And the more he cannon rushes, the less likely he's going to proxy production. Usually, if he's going to proxy production, he's only going to cannon rush one base. And then he's just going to make units at it, because you can barely afford to do that. Um, people who tend to cannon rush, like, three hatch... Like, you know, if, if let's just say you build an, another base at your third, and then he cannon rushes that, and then you cancel it after he starts a cannon. Like, you let him build the pylon, but then he builds a cannon... You cancel the hatchery, you go you know, somewhere else again, he follows it again, and he builds another pylon, and another cannon, you cancel it again. You build another base, he builds another pylon, and another cannon. Anyone who does shit like that, usually is not proxying production, because that is so fucking expensive to repeatedly cannon rush every single time you try to expand somewhere else. Uh, people who do that usually are going to be the kind of person who takes a natural nexus, and goes into, like, you know, sky toss, or so, like what you kind of just said a second ago. So, Overlord number two always follows the drone that's trying to expand, okay? Overlord number three, your third Overlord, is going to re-scout the cannon rush in front of your base. If you haven't yet already seen, like, a gateway or a robo, and you're going to try and just see, okay, how did he position his cannons? Where are his shield batteries, if there are any? Where, where is his production, if there is any? And these should all be things that you should be looking for, as long as your first Overlord has not yet seen a Nexus. So if he doesn't expand, expect production of proxy. If he does expand, expect more of like a Stargate follow-up probably, or some type of a tech follow-up, where he's, there's not going to be a robo, and there's not going to be a gateway in your base. 
Instead, all his deck is going to be at his base. Um, and for you uh, to, I hope I'm not losing you here. But the final, the final way to uh, wrap it all up, the proper responses to all of this. If your opponent is the kind of guy who does not proxy production and instead uh, expands behind a cannon rush, what you should do. Just hit diamond oh, for the sorry, first time using your B2G I and resources. Alert on the stream. It felt like I had a little vibe Obi Wan Kenobi hovering over my shoulder. Much love from Florida. Yo. Thank you, Bloodless. I appreciate you, man. I'm in the middle of a coaching lesson, but I fucking appreciate you very much, dude. Thank you. Um, so to reiterate what I was saying, um, the uh, if the proper responses are, if the guy goes for a natural nexus, if he is going to expand behind a cannon rush, three ravagers and stop. Just like literally three. And because uh, you're not going to deal with proxy production then. It's going to be a guy who just cannon rushes you and then expands and makes workers and does all that. So the way you should do it <coughs> is you make three ravagers and then you make a couple queens so that you have one queen per hatchery. <coughs> and, you, and you also have a uh, creep spreader that can push creep around all your hatcheries to try and connect them as fast as you can. And you just make drones behind that. And if it is an expansion, you can also rip some drones back off of gas after you've confirmed, okay, yeah, he's going to go crazy on workers, so how about we go crazy on minerals as well, after I have three Ravagers. Now, if it's the opposite, okay. if it's if it's a guy who goes for proxy production, you, don't, you do not stop mining gas, you do not stop making Ravagers at three, you just make literally as many as it takes until you break it. Because it all depends on how well you micro. Got it. Okay, and I should never pull drones, right? I just if, cancel the hatchery and yeah, go if, somewhere else. If you're going to go for a gas response with Ravagers, never pull drones. If okay. The only the only time it ever makes sense to pull drones is if you are basically just not going to take a gas at all. Uh, or like if you just stop mining gas, if you were going to go for like a speed opener. And your plan instead is to go for a Zergling Spinecrawler bust against the Cannon Rush. Which some people do that kind of stuff. I think that kind of stuff is harder though. Because it's very, very susceptible to failing if your micro is not perfect. Okay, good. Uh, next question is... I recently got attacked very early with disruptors and a lot of stalkers. I saw that, I scouted it, but I didn't know what to do against the disruptors. I had a lot of roaches and ravagers, but I'm not sure what to do against that. So, if you see... Uh, disruptors from Protoss. I would never recommend Ravagers. I would s Roaches are okay. Roaches are always good against Protoss, no matter what. They're a good opener unit because it allows you to be safe and greedy at the same time. But if you see a Protoss who is going for uh, just like Stalker Sentry, or uh, sorry, uh, uh, Stalker Disruptor, I would say a great response against that would be just get uh, Speedlings. Have the initial roaches that you have. Try to you like use them as much as possible. Try not to let them die just by walking into a disruptor shot or something. Just be annoying with them. Keep them alive for a while if you can. But go into zerglings and then go into aspire and go into mutas. And if you actually go into weapon upgraded melee and air weapon muta against stalker disruptor, it is so hard for Protoss to deal with that because lings fan out super fast and get good surface area on all the stalkers. And then it's really hard to micro disruptors in a way where you're hitting lings, but you're not hitting stalkers. And then like, if he's also going disruptor with stalker, his stalker count's going to be very low comparatively. If he has like five disruptors, five disruptors is the equivalent of like 15 stalkers. So if he's got like 20 disruptors and like five disruptor, tw uh, sorry, 20 stalker, five disruptor, <coughs> that could have been like 35 stalkers if it was just pure stalker. You know what I mean? So it's gonna he's going to have a very low stalker count and... That is very weak to mutiling combination. If you just switch full on into that. Okay, I, I haven't thought about muta against the stalkers because I thought it's a counter. But if you uh, see if you see disruptor, it's super good response. It's very strong. Okay, good. Uh, any zerk harassing options like bailing drops? Back in Brood War era, I did worker drops. Any of this is val valuable? I'm not sure. Um, so, Baneling drops against Protoss are... I would say, uh, honestly, I would recommend no. They're not viable. And the reason why I say they're not viable is because 
like you could do them, but it means you need to be going for a Ling Bane opener, and Ling Bane openers are really hard to do sometimes because it puts you in, it puts you the Zerg player in a position where you have you like you 100% have to get economy damage done to your opponent, otherwise it's very difficult to win the game. So you it like you can't just like not do damage and feel okay. So you always have to get damage done to feel like you're in the game still, and that puts a lot of pressure on you to always find a hole in your opponent's play where it's like, okay, I can push, I can punish that. Okay, now I can find that and punish that. But if you just go for like, like that's why I recommend roaches are better because roaches don't have to get economy damage done to be okay. And roaches also are stronger against things like sentries, which I don't know how often you play against it, but if you play against a sentry pushing Protoss and you go Ling Bane, it's very scary if he knows you're doing that because he can punish that really hard. Uh, like on the ground, force fields can just destroy banelings, and then uh, if you have drop lords and he knows that you're doing that, because let's just say, let's just say your opponent is very aware of your counter here, and he just makes a round of stalkers and focus fires your overlord, and then force fields out your initial ground army, it's really hard to get anything done. It's just it puts a lot of pressure on you, basically. Uh, so. I should open with roaches every time in Protoss. I, I recommend that, yeah. I think you should. It's so strong. Okay, and what should I transition later? <coughs> Whatever you want. So, here's the thing about roaches. If you go... If your build is either... Like, like I, I will just say your build's going to be a... Is you, okay, I'll, I'll, let me reword this. I don't want to make this confusing. Do you like to do speedling openers, just in general? Are you usually that kind of a guy? Yep. Okay, so that that's fine. Uh, so what your build could be is a speedling opener into Roach Warren, into three base saturation, and then you react to whatever you see. So it could become Roach Hydra. It could go from Ling Roach back into now Ling Muta, if it's the disruptor thing you said. You could go uh, into a just straight up Roach Max if you want to just run somebody over. That's like going for like maybe, let's say he's going Phoenix, okay? And you just like literally fucking have 160 supply of roaches and he's got 110 supply and he's doing a phoenix opener and he's run his third over that's a good way to do with that like you have you have, your options are kind of open to whatever you want it to be because you're giving yourself a good enough economy to give yourself options that's the point of the roaches okay. it, they're just super they're very versatile units for early game good Thanks, that were my questions. Let's go to the game, I guess. Sure, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, it's... Um, so... Watch with the others. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And then promote me to lobby host before we start. Perfect. Done. Perfect. Alright, so, and yeah, if you have any other questions, like anything pops in your head that you want to talk about, feel, uh, again, if, even if it's about Protoss again, feel free. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we can, um... So, l in looking at this, do you, before we really get into this, uh, so I don't get off on the wrong, on the wrong track here, do you have a desired playstyle that you want to make work, for sure, right now? Like, let's, let's just say you're really attached to, like, Ling Bane Hydra, uh... Or are you kind of just open to like whatever I see here is, you know, open to interpretation. I can just kind of go wherever I think would be efficient with it. Usually I start with Link Bane and then Hydra. Then I transition to either Broadwards or Workers. Most of the time, Workers uh, in the current patch. Okay, that's fine. That's it. I'm, I, yeah. okay. So that's good that you're going Link Bane Hydra against Terran in general. It's a very easy way to go about it. Um... I have one question for you though. Again, before we start, are you still going Ling Bane Hydra against Mech? Mm, I transition to workers. Okay. Uh, so, if if you don't do it already, uh, like lur lurkers are really good against like Thor based Mech and like Thor Hellbat type stuff. But if you're not doing it already, I would say Roaches and Aspire are a very good response as well to Mech. Um, to Mech. Yeah, to, to mech specifically, not bio. Uh, so, like, does this guy go mech or bio, just out of curiosity? Mm, th this guy was uh, Hellbat Rush. Okay. Well, well, we'll see how it goes, how the game develops for you. And 
we'll talk about it. But if if you do see Mech, I think uh, Roach Warren plays the same uh, role against uh, Protoss as it does against Terran Mech. It's just it's just a solid way to get a good a good economy early game. Anyways, so by mech you mean tanks? Yeah, yeah, like anything, uh, just like multiple factories. Okay. Any any form of mech, it could be uh, cyclone hellion, it could be tank hellion, it could be thor hellion, it could be a hybrid of tank thor, hellbat, anything really. Are they're just weak against that. They're not against weak against it. Against tanks. They're not, they're not weak against it early game. They are weak against oh, it late game, but early game it's different. Should I try to out macro him and rush him with uh, 200 supplies of roaches? Uh, so that is kind of, uh, okay. So if your opponent does not play tank turtle, it could work. But if your opponent does make tanks and turtles up a bit, that would probably fail. The only way that would work then is if, like, let's say you put a Nidus in his base and you hit him in the front and in the back at the same time, and like you just wiped out an entire mineral line or something, and then he just fell behind. Uh, Sounds hard. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I would say maybe not Roach Max would be like it's probably not the best idea. The only time Roach Max would be more appropriate is if you know for sure he's going for anything that's not tank. Like if he's going, if he's being aggressive on the map with Hellion Cyclone, that would be an okay time to do it. But uh, the thing about Roaches again is that it's very larva light on your on your production so it'll it just allows you to have more larva invested into drones faster because and also you don't have you don't have to make it's not, not only is roaches lar lar light on the larva because um they you know it you just you need less of them that's kind of what i'm trying to say here like 10 roaches can keep you so safe early game uh against most things and if you compare that to the uh, lings they, what 10 roaches can do effectively against, let's say, like, Hellion-type pressures, you'd need, like, four times that amount with Zerglings. Like, you need, like, 40 Zerglings, or, like, maybe even more. Maybe, like, 50 Zerglings to do what 10 roaches could do. It's ridiculous. And even then, it we, we could still be bad for the Lings, because if there's, like, potential for that to just fall apart with AoE. Okay, so your scout. This needs to be more, for sure. Uh, in front of his natural. They're like you saw the Reaper, so like it, the okay, so the fact that you saw the Reaper is amazing. That already tells you your Overlord can't die if you poke the ramp and poke the the natural, because it means he made a he didn't make he's not stacking Marines on you. So if only one Marine shows up, you easily have enough time to see the natural and the ramp and not lose the Overlord. Even if he po pokes you with the Marine the second his Marine spawns after the Reaper make, got made. So seeing if he ha if he does have a natural and seeing what he's making at his ramp right now you could have the information to go okay yep this is a hellion opener where he goes i believe i believe i did that okay well uh yeah, your lord it, it stopped right now though and every second that this is happening is very very important okay. uh we'll see how long it takes for your lord to move forward but it should be like priority number one because right now i'll, I'll tell you why okay if you make drones right now this is and you're making drones right now. Just keep this in mind, okay? Let's just say your opponent was actually not going for a factory, and let's say he was going for like multiple multi racks reaper all in, and let's say he has one barracks on his ramp to make it look like somewhat of a standard build, but he doesn't have a natural, and you don't, and then you scout further into his base and there's no natural at all, and you're like, okay, this guy's also on like double gas, as you scout deeper into his base. And then you're like, okay, well now let's prepare for some type of aggression because this is very weird. It's double gas opener with low SCV count on the mineral line. And there's, you know, there's only a barracks in his base. So something is weird is happening here. And then he has like a few more proxied racks and like a, near your third base right now. And then he just shows up with like five Reapers. And you're like, oh, okay. Like that, that literally, that, that is something that is obviously not happening in this game. But that's shit that you should think about that... Seeing the command center rules builds out like that, like automatically. So seeing it as fast as you can tells you, like, it confirms to you that it's actually safe to drone, and it's not literally kind of just like rolling the dice, being like, hopefully we're okay. It's very important to always, always get that read as quick as you can. And then the other thing too, so okay, here you go, here's your scout. The, the other thing too is uh, it's 
it gives you like a uh, a good read on his build too if you see the initial setup of when the reactor was started um to, uh, opposed to like when the factory was started because i mean it not okay so everybody doesn't have to always build all their stuff as well at the doorway like they could build like one building here and then move everything else somewhere else but if you see when stuff is started, it gives you just an easier understanding of what is going to probably follow it up. As opposed to if you scout late and you just see something there already, you don't know in the order it was taken. And seeing how the order of something being taken is easier to read a build in general. In a way, it just it it makes it easier to understand what your opponent's doing, basically. So I'm just I know I'm putting a lot of emphasis on this, but it's very very important on the. Uh, Scout right off the bat, which I think it was like probably 50 seconds late for you. Alright, so now we're gonna talk about his build here really fast. So if you see this right here, okay? We're looking at your vision of your overlord in his main base. You now know, okay, yeah, he's got a natural, he has 111. What what do you think the possibilities are with what he has here? Actually, I'm not sure about that. Okay, so I'll I'll just I'll tell you what I think could happen here. Marauder, so, he'll, he'll button drop shit. Yeah, exactly. That, that is one thing that could happen. The way it, uh, that like so, most likely it's going to be some type of Hellion. Uh, that for sure, because I mean he's got a reactor factory and he rushed it out, so that makes sense that he's going to make Hellions. There is no guarantee he has to make Marauder medevac either with this. This could totally be a swapped tech lab to a starport and he could go into Banshee or get ready to go into BC. Or maybe even if he's crazy, go into a Raven. No one really goes Raven versus Zerg though. So it probably would either be a Banshee or a Battlecruiser. But if you look at the lights on the buildings, you can and you know how to read a building that is not producing versus a building that is producing. And you see, oh yeah, okay, his starport is, the three lights are lighting up. He's building something out of the starport, even though it's not actually added on to anything, which means he can either build a Viking Liberator or a Medivac, and then his barrack starts lighting up, you can be like, okay, yeah, this is, uh, why did he make a tech lab on the barracks? The only thing he can make because of that tech lab right now is a Marauder. So then it would, if you see Marauder Hellion, guaranteed Hellbat timing. That is so, like, it's very, very few reasons why that would not be a hell, Hellbat timing. It's probably because your opponent doesn't know what he's doing, but anyone who knows what they're doing with Terran, this, if he makes things out of these three buildings right now, this is always a hellbat timing. And a great way to deal with this, uh, I, there's a few ways you can deal with it. Like, you can make spines, you could just make extra queens, you can make a bailing nest. But the best way to deal with it would be just make a roach warren. Literally. And then you just, you kite the hellbats, you kill them, and then you charge forward into dealing with the marauders afterwards. And let your queens kind of like pop a medevac. Or just have your queens there helping t absorb damage against the marauder while your roaches kill the, hell the hellbats first. But again, also another reason, or not, sorry, not, not reason, but another thing here is if I were you, I would actually just leave the overlord over the top of his production right now. The one that was just there. Because you, again, you don't know for sure if it is a hellbat timing or not yet because you haven't seen the barracks do anything yet. So this dude could totally just be fucking with you if he if, if he wanted to, if he, if he decided not to do it, where he could just be like, okay, he's leaving and I'm going to swap after he leaves. And now he'll not be sure what I'm doing anymore. Uh, because if, if this dude is going to make a Viking, which he is, then your overlord's going to die either way. But getting that information is super important. And uh, like no one's going to make a tech lab on this barracks and then make a Marine. Like he's just not going to do that. It's such a waste of time if he does. Uh, and like, even like the thing about it is, is I think a lot of Zergs are really paranoid about losing their Overlord. But even if you did make him make a Marine, and his plan was to go for a Hellbat timing, and he's like, "All right, I'm gonna make a Marine now," it's that in itself is a win-win situation for you because he's wasting so much time to not actually fully invest into his timing, and he's deviating his build in all these weird ways to try and be like, "I'm gonna be sneaky about it." Uh, so yeah, I would say leaving your Overlord here is very critical right now because you don't know what he's what he's going to commit to yet. And furthermore, what you could also do, maybe, uh, is you could have actually scouted deeper into his base just for a second to see his second gas, if he has it. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because if he has a second gas, 
he is less likely. Here, here's the thing, right? Let me let me tell you to read someone's build here pretty quick. If he has two gas right now, Marauder Hellbat, if he does decide to commit to that, is not gas expensive. Second gas means he's most likely going to take production again before he takes a third base, which means you're probably going to be getting hit by a heavy two base timing at some point in time. If he does not have a second gas, it means he's probably going to go for a third command center and you're going to be dealing with a timing attacking Terran that is going to switch the uh, gears really hard back into macro. So information like that is very important to just knowing how to read what's going to happen. And then furthermore, if you see, oh, he's got a, he has an armory in his base, then that is like, again, that's a that's like the, the golden light. Yep, it's a Hellbat all-in because you have to have an armory to make Hellbats. So there is, and then, you know, the fact that he has another gas that is natural too, like that's huge, right? I'd be like, wow, three gases? Yeah, this dude's going to be two base for a while. If he takes a third command center while taking this many gas this fast, his build is so bad. Uh, if, if that's what he does. Uh, but most likely, I imagine he's going to be making more factories or something after this. But uh, so far, does that make sense, though? Uh, so far, yep, yep. Okay, of course. I actually never think to check the second gas. Yeah, it, it it's sure it, it's definitely it's it's a good thing to do for sure because it gives you so much confidence in what you feel like should happen. Uh, I'm gonna pause it and just say this one uh, interesting thing really fast. I think it's it's important in my opinion. Even if you're wrong, like it, like there's there's um knowing how to read a build is only a part of it, and then you, what your opponent actually does is another part of it. So if you go, wow, he's got a lot of gas. It only makes sense that he goes for gas costing things now because. Why would he take a lot of gas right now before he even has decent saturation? Like he's gone three gas and his natural mineral line is so undersaturated. Uh, why would he do something like that if he's going to take a mineral, a pure mineral costing follow-up, which is the third command center? Like why would that happen? If he does do that, his build is inefficient. So even if you're wrong, it doesn't make, it doesn't matter at all because if his build's inefficient, it's super slow. So you can be wrong and still win. But if you're right and you go, wow, he's got a lot of gas. Okay, he's probably going to go for gas costing things like, for instance, more factories, possibly a second starport. Who knows? Anything that costs a lot of gas for Terran. Uh, it, I would say most likely, like like 80% chance it's going to be factories. Because uh, that's most commonly going what, you know, what should happen. And if, it, if, if you're right and you're like, yeah, it's going to probably be factories then you can make an educated guess as a follow-up to be like, okay, well, let's prepare myself for what I think is good against what should be factories. So you could be like, all right, let's get, in my opinion, it would be a Roach Horn. Be like, all right, I got a Roach Horn. I'm good to go. I can go into Roach Ravager if I have to. I can go pure Roaches if I need to. I can get some creep spread to give my Roaches good mobility. <coughs> and then, you know, and then that could be your starting point and you go from there. And then you can follow up another scout again in the future. You know, confirm what's happening, see what's going on. But that's like a great way to get an initial read with confidence as to what's happening instead of just kind of making random guesses. And if you choose the wrong thing, then you're behind. And I would say going for mass lings is definitely not a great thing to do because lings are going to just get eaten alive by hell bats. Uh, the best thing, you, if you ever do find yourself, I'll just throw this out there too before we continue. If you ever find yourself with a lot of lings and you, you're like, oh shit, I read it wrong. He's actually going for hell bats. And you don't have banelings, okay? The best thing you can do for yourself is counterattack his base with your zerglings. Literally, just run across the map, away, like run around him, and go kill his SCVs. Be and then try your best to make something better if you can. Like start making roaches, or start making more queens, or something. Because your if you just send your lings into like eight hellbats with a medevac, you're gonna watch them all just r just get barbecued, and you're gonna kill nothing. Because the medevac's just going to heal all the damage your lings did, and all your lings are just immediately going to die. Okay, that makes sense. But... Will this happen like a base trait or something like that, or...? So, 
it won't be a base trade if you prepare properly. And just know that a proper response to a Hellion opener, it's like a Hellion, a Hell Bat, sorry, a Hell Bat opener with a Marauder like this, is a Roach Warren. So if you, if you have a Roach Warren, there is no need to have a base trade. Like, you could totally make Roaches, and if you had like 10 Roaches here, and we're talking like 10 Roaches and like 4 Queens, you could defend this. And you could make, you could just make more Roaches as the fight starts, if you're feeling paranoid, if you're like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to win this fight. Those initial 10 roaches will bleed his army down so low. Like, you'll kill pretty much all the Hellbats, and you might even... You might even kill a couple of the Marauders, but... Maybe not. But guaranteed, you'll kill, like, all the Hellbats. And that is huge, because that means there's, like, no pressure now on your drones. Because Marauders are going to kill drones super slow. And also, if you're making more roaches during the fight... There's going to be nothing then to cover the Marauders from the next round of roaches. That can just run the Marauders over. The Hellbats is, are the really scary part because they'll just walk forward and your whole middle line just dies uh, in seconds. So having a Roach Warren is a great counter to this. It's a great counter to anyone who opens up Factory at all. Uh, but and then if you if you but again if you just found yourself without before you had a read if you got one now and you were like oh oh shit okay I, I didn't need these links I don't need them I wish I didn't make them but I I have them I need to make Roaches now. That's what that like in that situation. That is when you would be like, okay, well, as soon as he leaves his base and he comes to attack me, counterattack, and then I'm just gonna literally like a move into his middle line and forget about it, and I'm gonna focus all of my attention on my roaches and queens defensively, and whatever happens to my lings happens, and I guarantee you're gonna kill a middle line, and then if you defend your base because you're making roaches and you wipe out an entire SCV middle line, furthermore, if he doesn't even realize what you're doing and you kill the command center, the game's over. You just you have now won the game. Because he'll have no follow-up after this is over. It's just, it, again, don't make lings if you know what's happening. But if you find yourself having them before you knew what was happening, use them to counterattack. Do not use them to attack the Hellbats. Okay, nice. Alright... And so you're again. So again, we, we talked about how, how I, I do think Roachhorn is a better response. You don't have it though, so you have a baneling nest. It is a way you can defend it, but now if you had a bane nest, again, I don't recommend you do this. If you, so let me. Let, I'm gonna. I don't want to make this confusing, but I I feel like I need to say this to try to make this as uh, understandable as possible. If you open up Ling Bane against Terran, and if you have not been able to scout properly and you find yourself in this position now where you're like, shit, I have a Bane Nest. No, right? Vibe said make a Roach Horn, but I don't have one. I have a Bane Nest and he's doing a Hellbat timing. This is that instance where now you don't actually counterattack with Lings because you've gone for Bane Lings. So now you would just make, you would just wait on it, make Banes. And as soon as you have, and we're talking about, you make probably like 10 Bane Lings here. And then once you have the Banelings, you ram them into the Hellbats, and then your Lings clean up the rest. That is what you have to go for now, because you've gone for a Bane Nest. But ideally, you're going to get a, a good scout off in the early game. You'll be more liberal with how you place your Overlords, so you'll be like, okay, we're confident that I have a good idea what is happening here, and it's going to be Hellbats. And if you knew that, and you made Roaches, then the Lings would become a counterattack, or you just wouldn't have them at all, really. But if you have Lings and Banes, you have to use Lings defensively. Does that make sense? I just want to make sure that this is not confusing. Yep, makes sense. Okay. Um, and then I would say, if you don't already have these uh, this like written down, I would definitely recommend for you to write this down or just commit this to memory. I'm writing everything you say. <laughs> okay. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, okay. First Overlord yeah. Scout, don't stop. Okay? you're th like Do not ever stop on the cliff and be like, we're chilling for a while. Always get that fast read, like we talked about a minute ago, on that command center and, and all also on his ramp as soon as you can. The only time it's ever appropriate to stop on that cliff is if you see like two marines the second your overlord gets here because he did not make a reaper and he just started making marines right away. Then I would say, okay, yeah, sure. If you're just going to fly off the cliff and immediately die, stay on the cliff. It's okay. But if there's no marine there, just you have to scout. You definitely need to get that scout off. So that's very important, number one, for scouting. 
Number two, always try to start setting an overlord into his base at four minutes with an overlord that is near his base. So your second overlord should sit by your natural until your natural is basically done just to be safe against weird proxy bunker stuff. And then as soon as your natural is like just about to finish or it has now just finished, send your second overlord to the outside of his base, like probably outside of his main base. And at four minutes, come back to it and send it into his main. If your first overlord has not given you the read that you need yet, that way you can get a chance, a good chance at a second read on his build. And if he doesn't make a Viking first and deny that overlord, your second overlord has a very high chance of going, oh, he's going mech, oh, he's going bio or whatever. He's going for a third CC really fast. <clears throat> It'll give you a really good read. So four minutes is like that sweet spot to scout. And if that dies and you don't get that scout off, the second your layer is done, immediately start an overseer and scout again. So that's that. That's like the third step if your four minute scout failed. Because at least then you'll still get a read before crazy things happen like this. Or yeah, I was not sure whether this guy is going to do battle cruiser, so I made spores, but that was unnecessary. Yeah. Also, uh, at what time battle cruiser should appear on my uh, on my base if the opponent is doing the build correctly? Okay, I'm gonna answer this question, but just for the sake of fun, can I want you, if you wouldn't mind, to just say really fast, battle cruiser operational. Sorry, I have to, I have to say that. <laughs> Battle cruiser operational. <laughs> Dude, you like sound just like the PC guy. <laughs> I'm sure about that, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. So uh, if a guy goes for BCs, like just straight up. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> if a guy goes for BCs straight up, like the BCs should be teleporting into your base by like a fast one is going to be between five to six minutes like probably like 5 30 okay yeah. like five five thirty is a fast bc if he's a standard bc player where it's like a natural um there's a natural base there's he's gone for a hellion opener and then he goes into bc after like he still techs up to it but he takes a natural as well six minutes right, right around six minutes like now you'd be seeing a bc you'd be getting ready where's that bc it's going to teleport any second now uh if that was what was happening so if you start your spores for BC defense at around like 515, you'll be great. Um, and it, But again, uh, you know, that overlord scout that's going to happen at four minutes ideally is going to tell you if he is or is not going for BCs. Because at that point, you should also see if he has, you know, if he's getting ready to make that fusion core uh, in his base. <coughs> so yeah, 515 for BC. Perfect spore time. Okay. Okay. Great. So I should apply to Blizzard for the StarCraft 3 sound check, I Yeah, guess. dude. Seriously. Like, when you said <laughs> Battle Cruiser, I was like, dude, you sound just like the PC guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so now, at this point... This is just like this whole problem for you is happening only because you uh, you did not have Banes started before it hit you, which sucks. Like if your Banes were started a little bit sooner because you knew he was doing this and you caught him right here. Uh, let me show you right when it would have been great. Right now. Okay, so the second, th this is why this is important, okay? If you have to, if you have to go banelings against this, it is best to wait until he is in a choke point. If you, if there is, if the map allows you to have one, like for instance, he walks up a ramp, because it's really, really hard now for him to split his units properly because he's in a tight little area. So your banelings have the highest percent chance to have a good connection here. So if you engaged him right now, if like where that creep tumor is in your natural, if those were banelings, if like your banelings were located right there and you immediately started walking at him, as soon as he commits to the ramp, you just start walking at him and you, you blow up his hell bats, your lings follow that and then your lings clean up whatever else is there. There's a very good chance you're going to kill the majority, if not all the hell bats. And then your lings just kind of overpower the marauder because marauders kill lings super slow and then you'd be fine. If you went for the baneling defense. 
But the fact that your Beylings are starting right now, and you have to wait for another 12 seconds, this is now creating a major problem for you that's going to be hard to deal with. So this whole game just came down to um, a super delayed reaction for you, which just needs to be fixed by, uh, you know, uh, just more scouting, a little bit more scouting on your part, and then getting a better read on what's happening. <laughs> but yeah, like you can see your your banelings did clean up the majority of the hellbats right there and they were even spread out even more uh, The one thing I, I don't like though is I what I want you to do in the future is I want you to actually s Just send the banelings in first and then as the banelings are engaging you can send everything then right after because what you did there as well is you sent everything in right away. So what the Lings did is they got on the Hellbats right away. And they just... Like, the, the Zergling damage is irrelevant there. Because the Banelings are going to AoE and... Like, let's just say your Zerglings are killing one of the Hellbats. And you lose six Lings to, to smash one of the Hellbats hit points down by 30. Okay? Because Hellbats are going to kill Lings super fast. And then your Banelings smash into another Hellbat... Because the Lings are blocking the hell, like the Lings are blocking the Banelings away from the Hellbat that is currently taking damage. They wrap around and get on the Hellbat that is not taking damage because it doesn't have Lings on it yet. But when the Banelings connect to the Hellbat with like full HP, it's splash damaging anyways the Hellbat that's already taking damage. And the Banelings are, even, are they're still killing the full HP Hellbat while simultaneously killing the Hellbat that is weaker. But because your Lings kind of blocked the Banelings surface area to get on the Hellbats right away, um, you lost Lings for that, and you also uh, like you, it just like it made the Banelings job a little less effective and then you still the the final result is you still kill the Hellbats but you lose the majority of your Lings one way or you lose very little Lings another way uh, be, just because the, if the Banelings aren't being blocked they're not being path blocked by Lings in front of them and the Banelings now can just take full straight up connections they're gonna die but they're gonna they explode so they're gonna kill the Hellbats with them either way but if you save the majority of your lings, then you can actually have an overwhelming amount to overpower the few remaining hellbats, if there are any, and also the marauder. Uh, the the number I was saying that he should make a second ago, guys, in chat, I was saying a good number to go for here, if if you have to make banes, is about 10. Just make like 10 banes, and you're probably going to be fine. It only takes um, about 5 banelings to kill a hellbat. 5 banelings... Damage wise, uh, <clears throat> or sorry, four four banelings damage wise is actually uh a hundred and forty, which could actually kill a hellbat with four banes. But you gotta also realize he has medevacs, so there's a chance the medevac might get healed five HP, or it's rather six HP, oh, and it might live with one HP yeah. in the process. So five banelings realistically with the medevac is going to have enough damage to overpower the medevac heal and actually kill the hellbat. But if you make ten banes. There's a good chance you're gonna kill like eight hellbats kind of bunched up. Like the, you're gonna you're gonna either weaken the, a few of them and kill the, the the majority, or you're gonna kill all of them with like ten banes. So ten banes is like a good number here. Um, but yeah, now it's uh, yeah, it's just it's rough at this point for sure. Okay, so we're going to look at drones now. Uh, you actually have a bit more drones. It's actually, like, all things considered, you're still in a good spot this game, even though you just got kind of messed up right there. You lost some queens. You lost a ton of lings. You've remade some lings. Uh, you didn't lose that many drones, surprisingly. You only lost three, uh, which is nice. But, uh, like, it's definitely, you definitely want to be further ahead than you are. And I feel like you could have been if you went for a roach response. Now, going back to the Terran, do you remember how I said if you saw he had a lot of gas, that he would probably follow it up with more production? <clears throat> it just makes sense, yep. right? So he that's what he did. Like, he didn't do a build that's super... Like, his build is very aggressive. I wouldn't say it's super inefficient. I don't, I don't actually like his build. I'm not going to say that I like his build, but at least it's following the right path of what it should be. It's because he, he took a lot of gas before he had a lot of minerals, and his initial opener was 1-1-1. And then he threw three barracks on behind that and double engineering bay before starting a third base. So he did definitely throw on more production after his 
you know, while doing his push because he prioritized gas a lot harder than minerals. If he would have prioritized the minerals and taken only like one gas, I would have been like, the chances of him having a third command center after 111 and then making production are much higher. And the differences in these kinds of things are if he goes for a lot of production before taking a third command center. So if he goes 111 and then another three racks and then a command center, chances are his macro game is going to be very slow. He's going to have very, very, very slow amounts of, you know, like, oh, like his. His continued power throughout the game is going to be very limited. But his initial power for a big, strong timing is going to be high potential. Like, anyone who plays high production with slow expansions has a very, very powerful single attack, and then it kind of drops off really hard. Okay, that's how that usually always goes. But somebody who goes for a fast economy and then goes for production so if you go if he would have went for like a faster third and then prioritized more barracks that kind of a player always has limited amounts of pressure they can do to you right away like it's mostly like harassment if they do attack you it's it's not like an all-in and then it ramps up as the game goes on to a stronger and stronger and stronger point faster so it's one of them has power early one of them has power later the faster command center means power later the delayed command center means power early um, so right now, knowing if you knew what his build was, I would say a great response to this would be saturate three bases as fast as you can because you just created a drone window for yourself because you killed his initial push. But as soon as you have three base saturation, stop making drones and make army get to get ready to be attacked by probably like now around 10 minutes. Nine, 10 minutes would be what I would guess if you looked at the game clock just by how this game is going. If we look again, I would say nine or 10 minutes, you're going to be getting hit by a timing, probably 10 minutes. Uh, just because of how the build works. That's about how, because of how StarCraft works. Like that, You just need a couple minutes to prepare whatever you're going to do. If this guy would have gone for a third command center after 111, I would say take your fourth base, saturate your fourth base as fast as you can right now, and then make an army. Because this dude is not going to be able to attack you for a long time because he prioritized economy, and you also just killed his army. So... This dude now needs to play super conservatively. He needs to play super defensive to guard his third base. And if he does attack you, it would at most be like a meta back drop. That was that would be like I got eight marines in your base or something like that. Oh, yeah. Do, do you, does that make sense? Do you? Uh, I get yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. That is that is a major concept of StarCraft though. That if you just get a good scout read in the early game. You can make these choices really fast and not like hesitate and be like, well, do I want to make like 20 lings right now? Okay, we'll make like 20 lings and be okay, I think, but now I'll make some drones. If you ever do things like that, you're definitely slowing your pacing down in the game. And that's why you never really break off from your opponent. Uh, if you're both like doing things that are like extra, extra, extra safe and then a little greedy and then extra, extra, extra safe, you both like just kind of stunt your growth throughout the game. It's like speed bumps in your build repeatedly if you play that way. Uh, so again, right now, the proper response for you, I would say, would definitely be saturate three base. You can start a fourth, but don't saturate it, and then make an army because you should be expecting to be attacked in the next two minutes. I just saw the drones. Yeah. I never returned them to the minerals. <laughs> I thought they are lost. Uh, yeah, that definitely... Uh, Definitely sucks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, typing as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely kind of pain. It's painful. It Those are sitting there for a while, too. Till the end of the game, not for a while. <laughs> Until the, okay. All right, then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's but, definitely... But the, the end is near, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. But, so if you sat... You do have already... Like we're let's, let's uh, think about this with me for a second. Imagine if these drones were mining, okay, that are just sitting there, and then everything was fully saturated properly, and you stopped droning at 66, which is what you're kind of at right now. You you would have a good economy to work with, and if you knew he was going for, uh, you know, a pressure build, like he made. Again, you're, you're basing this off the fact that he went for a lot of gas. Even if you didn't get that next follow-up scout, you should expect this. Uh, if you were making units at that point, you would be able to crush this timing again. And if you crush this timing again, you could then make a choice to go, 
do I want to all in him now and just make units and just capitalize on killing whatever I can? Or do I want to saturate a fourth now and then be at that optimal saturation where I never have to make drones again ever and then kill him? Like you could make either choice if you followed the previous, the, the thing I said basically two minutes ago or one minute ago about the proper way to deal with his style of Terran, which is high production after through after 111, late third, would be three base saturation and then unit production. Because the golden rule of Zerg is one base saturated above your opponent and make an army. Once you have map control, then you can do whatever you want. Okay, so... This is uh, what I would say needs to happen right now. In this part of the game now, you definitely have a bit of a struggle situation going on because you did not get Baneling speed. Bane, if you're gonna go, if if you are gonna go Banelings, that is like the key upgrade to make Banelings not sh not suck ass. It is required. It's so important. That is like the mandatory upgrade you always need if you're gonna go Banes. Uh, so not having that is definitely hurting you really badly. And if your opponent ever goes Widow Mines like this, where they just set up and they just kind of sit there, what you need to do, be patient, make units, but you need to make more Banes for sure, right? You don't have enough right now. You have six. You need to make more Banes. And what you want to do is you want to send in chunks of your army to set off the Widow Mines and not actually lose everything of yours all at once. And I would say versus what he has, he has... Five Marines, three Hellbats, five Widow Mines, two Marauders, and seven Medivacs. This army is very Medivac heavy. It's very bio light. So you don't need to send in that much Ling Bane. There's not going to be a lot of DPS here for him to be able to wipe out a lot of it. You could actually send in like four Banes and like six Lings. And you could set off, I bet, almost every Widow Mine with that. You just send him in. And if he doesn't run away, your Bane Lings blow him up. If he does run away, your Widow, the Widow Mines get set off by your Lings. And then once you set off either all or at the very least the majority of the Widow Mines, it's kind of going to be a judgment call for you to if you're confident that you're like, okay, yeah, most of the Widow Mines or best case scenario, all the Widow Mines have gone off now. You have a 30 second window then. It's really 29 seconds, but we're just going to say 30 because it makes it easy. You have a 30 second window to run forward and capitalize while his Widow Mines are down basically and you just crush everything. <clears throat> However, if you just send everything in all at once when all the Widow Mines are active, usually what's going to happen is is you're going to see a lot of dead Zerg and lots of explosions. I've seen that a lot of times already. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice tip, actually. <clears throat> yeah. So you have to just send your army in segments against Widow Mines or else it gets, kinda it gets just really messy for Zerg. And okay, so now his army's a bit bigger. Now, this is a little bit more threatening. Now he's got a decent amount of bio. He's got 13 marines there. He's got, he still only has two marauders, but 13 marines is actually a little bit more formidable here. Uh, he still only has three hellbats. He has still has seven medevacs. And now he also has more widow mines. Now he has uh, seven widow mines. At this point, now, I, a second ago, I was like, with the little army he had, you could have sent in like maybe like four banes, six, six lings or some shit like that. Now I would say you kind of need to send in maybe like 10 banes like 8 to 10 banes and maybe like 12 links or like 12 to 15 links just again not your whole army because in total you have 24 banes and 38 links so we're not sending everything in we're just sending in maybe like a fourth of your army now or just a good chunk of it you want th the concept you want to you want to make sure happens is you want to have enough links go forward to where if he doesn't run away your links are going to die as you, but you're going to have enough links there to where they're going to have they're going to buy enough time for your Bane Links to make connections. So you're not going to send in all your Links. You're just going to send in enough to where like, okay, Bane Links, you now can smack these Marines if they just literally stand there and auto attack. You want to send in enough Banes to where if he doesn't run away as well, you're going to capitalize on crushing a lot of his army. So again, if you have, uh, I think like a third of your army should be Banes here, which it kind of is. It pretty much is. Yeah, it's, it, You have a good ratio right now of Banes to Links at this point. But if you send in like eight banes, that's not all of your banes. 
or like 10 bands. We're talking about like a third of what you currently have of your current bands. So it's just a chunk. Again, it's enough bands to really break widow mines, to break marines, to do some. You're going to fuck him up basically if he doesn't move. You're going to do some damage. Um, but if he does move, it's enough to where a lot of the widow mines are going to be like targeting all these different units because the way AI works for widow mines is every single widow mine is going to target a separate unit. And if all of your units engage roughly around the same time, a lot of widow mines are all going to go off at the same time. Furthermore, if you actually micro your lings a little bit and you just go like some of my lings stay in widow mine range, but go a little bit left and some of my lings go a little bit right, you increase the odds that more widow mines go off as well. Stuff like that uh, is great. It's amazing. But generally speaking, just setting off a lot of the widow mines is you know, going to happen if he runs away. Because then what happens is, yeah, you don't get bailing connections anymore, but you didn't throw away your whole army. You just threw away a little chunk of it. And he invested into a ton of widow mines. So you just traded out all of his AOE for only a little bit of yours. And then now you just capitalize on being like, hey, undefended bio, I'm going to run you over with Ling Bane again. Yeah, like that, what am I? Like engaging and then backing up like that, that was huge for him. That was... Th that 30 units just died for you. And I, th and now your Bane Link count went from 24 to 11. So 13 of those were Banes that just died. I mean, you still won the fight, though. Surprisingly. Like, that could have gone so bad for you. <clears throat> but now, yeah, yeah, the drop in your main definitely sucks. So, the, the thing about ZVT is this matchup is all about control, okay? <clears throat> it's all about control. And right now, you have none of it, and this is why. Right now, you're losing control of the game. Like, you've already kind of lost control a bit, but now you're losing even more. Like, you're about to, like, fall off the cliff, basically. Because your opponent is setting up four and five command centers at his gold base right now. He's setting up for a greedy fucking response. Like, this is him kind of starting to get ready to explode in the game here. You, on the other hand, do not have a fourth base started yet, which is definitely going to bite you in the ass in the future. <clears throat> you definitely need to expand a little bit faster than you are. Like, just start making, as soon as you, as like, have this be a rule for you, okay, all the time. As soon as you fully saturate your current base, that like, your current newest base, start another base. Just start another one. Go take, that's when you take, uh, and this is after three bases. So, your third base timing was okay, I liked it. But we're talking about, like, base number four, base number five, base number six. As soon as you take it and you saturate it, take another base. So, and again, you you do want to stop also around like 80 drones. We're also talking about like, okay, my main's mining out and I'm sending drones to my fourth, take a fifth. Okay, my natural's mining out and I'm starting to send drones to my fifth base or my sixth base or whatever, take another base. Is every time you start saturating another base, take another base. Don't be, uh, be very liberal with expanding as Zerg, especially against Terran. Just don't feel like it's never okay to expand. Expand a lot. It's it's totally fine. It's wor It's definitely worth it. Because it's also going to help you spend your money and your, give you more larva. Um, secondly, the thing that's screwing you here that made you kind of lose control is the fact that your creep spread is non-existent right now because he, you had a little bit of it earlier and he killed it and now you have only one tumor at this point. So you're playing a very blind and a very uh, weak mobility game for Zerg here. So uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, what needs to happen for you is... Uh, you just need to really always make that priority where if you're not currently scouting what's happening, you definitely need to get that creep going as quick as you can. You need to get creep that, just start creeping again because if you, even if you weren't attacking the Terran and you're just creeping your base up, that's indirectly winning the game because you're giving yourself better odds to win the future fight. Is so important against Terran. And it also can scout things like, oh, look, he's dropping me. I can see it with my creep tumors. It gives you such good, like, advantages in the game. It's it's the it's the best tool Zerg has. That's uh, definitely not happening for you this game, unfortunately. Yep, everything happened too fast. Exactly, yeah. But the I thing is... got the drones, the creep. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of things happen too fast, though. 
because you didn't know what to expect. So you're you're doing crisis mode reactions where you're like, shit, 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 shit. Okay, I need this. Shit, shit, I need that. Okay, I need this. I need that. But if your first scout was a bit more prioritized and you just read the game, how we kind of broke it down uh, and started this coaching re uh, lesson, you could have read the game as, okay, aggressive Terran. I expect aggression. I make roaches. I'm okay. And then you're just like, wow, easy defense. Oh, another easy defense. Wow, holy shit. These defenses are so easy. And you don't have to dedicate as much time because you've 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 already mentally prepared for it before it happened, and then you have physically prepared for it because you know what's happening. And then when it happens, it just feels fucking easy. And you're like, okay, that was a uh, much easier to, to defend than you know not realizing what's happening and panicking as it does. Like for instance, the whole the whole hellbat thing walking into your base and having Bane's morph right then that was a that's a proper, but it is a panic response. Because you're like, shit, I need Banes. And then what happens when you make Banes? All the drones run to the bottom of your main and you don't ever use them again. But if you had a response <laughs> where, you know, you knew that was happening because you're like, I know he's doing it. And you make Banes and, and how we talked about how you connect to him like on the ramp. You're, suddenly your drones never leave the middle line and suddenly you have a way better position in this game because it's a, it's a, um, it's like a well executed defense that was read off of uh, your scout rather than a reaction that was read off of Holy shit! My my base is dying. I need to react immediately. It's it just makes the game way more comfortable for you if you uh, if you focus a lot of emphasis on like reading his build before he does things. And again, his resource allocation tells you so much about what he does. Even if you don't know what composition it is, how fast he takes his gas tells you how aggressive he wants to be. As a big part of it. <clears throat> I have a question. Sure. Uh, should I start learning how much every unit costs for uh, Terran, for Protoss? Yeah. I would say don't... You don't have to, like, flashcard yourself where it's like... Like, like for three hours a night, every night, <laughs> I'm just going to memorize these things. But start... Sure. <laughs> start uh, like, commit it to memory over time, though. Like, if I ask you, how much does a roach cost? Do you know that? Do you know what that costs? 75 minerals and 25 gas. Okay, yeah, perfect. Uh, like, start... Yeah, uh, most Zerg units, I know them, but... Okay, okay. With Terra and Protoss, yeah. Sure. Uh, st just start committing it to memory slowly over time. So, if you're, like, playing a game and you're trying to get a read on what he's doing, and let's say you go back into your replay and you look at what Terra has done so far, and you're like, okay, he's going for this kind of a build, um, you know... Let's just say you're like, okay, he's taking a lot of gas. Why is he taking a lot of gas? What costs a lot of gas here? And you look over his build and you're like, maybe you go, oh shit, dude, what? Hellions don't even cost gas. They're pure minerals. I didn't actually realize that. Or so, you know, if you have like this epiphany moment where you're like, fuck, holy shit, I didn't even know that that was that way. That could definitely be something that you commit to memory like that. Uh, it is totally worth it, though, to know what things cost, uh, what the costs of things are, because it'll help you actually understand how to read somebody's build when you scout them. Uh, but yeah, like definitely start working on that. Commit it, to your, commit it to memory over time, but be patient with yourself. Don't expect yourself to know everything within a few days. Like give yourself like literally like a month or two months to like really get it down. Because it, if you don't play eight hours a day, it's going to take a while probably. But it is useful information, though, for sure. Cool. Yeah, and at this point, you're yeah, you're definitely dead. Just because of yep. the, the... You have no creep spread. That's a big one. And then uh, <clears throat> you have too many drones on too few bases as well now. Uh, and again, the, the part of 13 drones <laughs> forever just chilling there. That was painful. That's a lot of economy just never being utilized. Um, yeah, so, like, all these things... Although I have I have a lot of minerals, actually. I don't have larva, I guess. Yeah. Th or, like, that's, yeah. that's something, too, where... That's why I'm saying be more liberal about expanding. And if you just... If you get, a good, if you get kind of reads and you kind of understand how to build things, where you're like, okay, should, like, this is a, looks like a hyper-aggro build. This looks like an aggressive player. I'll be defensive here. Or this looks like a really greedy player. I'll be greedier myself. 
That's just all you have to do to react to how people play. Uh, you could then, you know... As Zerg, I guess. Yeah, as, as Zerg, yeah. You, cause, because uh, this guy doesn't react to me. No, exactly. Like, well, the thing is, is you don't you don't really play reactionary if you're playing aggressive. That is that is also a rule of StarCraft. If you're going to do an all in, <coughs> or if you're going to do a very aggressive timing, and this guy this guy is build even though he has three base right now and now has five command centers, at five command centers doesn't mean shit. Don't don't think about. <clears throat> a lot of people think about StarCraft at the current minute that you're at. And that is so incorrect th to think about StarCraft that way. To be like, oh, at 12 minutes, he's got five bases. This is not all in. That doesn't mean anything. This dude opened up with a two-base hyper-aggressive opener because he took four gases on two bases. And he took gases at his natural when his natural had like five SCVs in the mineral line. That is so fucking bad for his economy. And then he followed that up with all upgrade buildings. He followed it up with double NG bay and armory. And also triple racks on top of one one one, so he was going off of four racks, factory, and then starport, with very low SCV count on mineral lines. That is a very aggressive, like I that that basically what that does to Terran is that puts him in a position where if you defend his attack while playing efficient, he's dead. So he is effectively kind of in an all-in scenario there because he needs to get damage done or he's fucked, or he's just gonna be screwed all game. The fact is, though, is he did get damage done, which is unfortunate for you. So it worked out for him. But that is just the case of how it is. The opener is everything. Uh, everything that happens after the opener can be whatever the hell you want it to be. And you can really bounce back and forth really fast because that's just how it goes. But the opener, it's it, you cannot be like, you know what? I'm going to macro now after doing a four gas opener on like 30 SCVs. You can't just be like, I'm going to macro now. Because if you do say that... Zerg should be like at 75 drones when Terran's at like 38 SCVs. That's just how that goes. If your build's efficient. Uh, uh, th and that's why his build's kind of like in an all-in territory like that. So the early game development is everything in StarCraft. It is fucking everything. And that's why early game scouts are so important in this game. Because you get a read on how his build is going to develop. Is it going to be super aggressive or is it going to be super macro-oriented? Or is it going to be a standard middle of the road build where it's just kind of going to be a good amount of economy, but it's also going to be a good amount of like, it's going to be a mix where he's just playing safe, but economical. Like there's three ways to play. And those are the three. It's either like one deep inside of all in or greed, or it's just a middle road build where it's just standard. And the best way to play against all of them is used as Zerg is you stay one base ahead of them in economy. And then you make an army. So if he's going for the hyper greed, you go for hyper greed. Three base Terran means four base Zerg. If he's going for the middle of the road build where he's going for a well-timed third, uh, it's it's a little bit later. But like, so he goes for like a decent amount of army. He does like a push and then goes for a third while he's going for the push. In those kinds of games, you defend the push and then you saturate your fourth. So it's like you would, you would defend first and then take a drone window. And then in games where he's going for like really, really aggressive builds, if it's a two base all in or or if it's a one base all in, you plus one that. So if a one base all in, you defend that with two bases. If it's a two base all in, you defend that with three bases of economy. And you totally can get away with all of those as Zerg. And then, you know, once you kill... The thing about all ins is once you kill it all in, you can do whatever you want. You can be like, all right, I'm going to make drones now. I'm going to saturate another base. And then now I'll have an even faster production and economy on my base that I can make an army even faster with. So the next time you attack me, I'll be producing units even quicker and I'll crush you even harder and then I can kill you. Or you could be like, well, I already have a better economy than him and I just killed his army. I, if I want to, I could just go kill him now. Like I, I could try to kill him now. It's not always going to work, but because if your opponent then switches into this like really turtly mode, it could he could potentially defend that, but yeah, it doesn't mean he wins the game though, because he's still behind. Those are like honestly like the general concepts and themes of StarCraft that are very important. That I feel like this game for you just weren't really followed as much as they could have been, only because it was just like I feel like this game was a perfect way to describe it was it was like an insecure feeling. This game where you're just like fuck, I don't know what really what's happening, and. I'm playing like I'm trying to play standard, but I feel like I'm just getting pressured here. Uh, and it's because you didn't read his opener.
So, and again, the the only place you went wrong this game, I'm gonna, like everything you did was okay, up until the point where you did not make a good reaction to hill bats. That's the only thing that fucked everything up for you. Because everything after that was just like, you're trying to like rebalance it and it just keeps falling off again. And you're like, oh god, this game's just not really working anymore. Because if you made Banes with what you had before the Hellbats walked into your base, a lot of these problems would have just disappeared. And you would have just crushed his armies over and over and over. Oh, and, then, <clears throat> and furthermore, if you would have made Roaches, realizing it's Hellbats, it would have been even easier. Good. So, if I have to open with Roaches most of the time, when should I open with Link Bane? If you see somebody who goes for straight up mech, anything, like if you ever see a second factory in his base, uh, before he has like 12 racks or 10 racks or something like that. So if you just see an emphasis on factories right away, Roach Warren, always. Do not make Ling Bane, just go Roach Warren. And then you can go into like Ling, Roach, Muta, some assortment of that. You could even then go into like Swarm Host. Just don't go Bane Links, literally. Bane Links are gonna not really get you very much done there. It's not worth it. Uh, because it puts you in a position where you have to get something done to his economy, otherwise it sucks. And that's very hard to do sometimes. <coughs> so, proper time to go Banelings is when you see an Ephesus on multiple barracks, you know, after 1-1-1. So, again, you could have been totally fine this game if you just made Banes against his early Hellbat timing, and then if you saw a barracks follow-up with a scout, Banelings are great. Uh, if you would have made a Roach War in this game, because you saw, oh, he's not just going Hellions, it's actually Hell Bats and Marauders, which is a more all-in version of a Hellion opener. Uh, it's very, very aggressive. If you if you made a Roach War, the perfect thing to do would be, I defended my base because I saw he was going to go Hell Bats. Now my response to defending this is I have a window to do whatever I want. Maybe I'll make a round of drones and I'll scout him again with an Overseer. If in doing so with that scout, you go, oh shit, he's going bio now because I see four racks or five racks in his base, not five factories or four factories. He's making a lot of barracks. You then could even, if you don't have it then, you could then start a baneling nest and go into baneling speed when it's done and you could just go Ling Bane Hydra. So your baneling nest can be delayed if opening Roach Warren makes more sense and you'd still be fine in a macro game. Because you would have had Banelings easily in time for this attack right now. If, if that was what you did. Good. Uh, just, Very informative. Yeah. Just just make a Baneling Nest uh, as an opener. If your opponent opens 2-1-1. Like, that's like a for sure, okay, yeah, Banelings will be fine here. Because it's he's gonna go for like bio drops, and you can you don't have to worry about making a roach warren as an opener then. But if your opponent does one 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 multiple factory anything hellion opener, you uh, and you're worried about okay, what about like some type of weird hellion timing? You could totally open up with just a roach warren and make a few roaches, just like you do against Protoss, and then you could shift back into Lingbane and you'd be fine. Um, just for defensive purposes. It's very effective. It's very easy. It's easier than Banelings. And I feel like it's going to give you what you're looking for, which is good creep control. It, it, like, you can literally put your roaches in front of your creep and be like, hey, Hellions, fuck off. <laughs> I'm going to spread creep here. Thanks. Because <laughs> if he tries to attack the creep, he's going to lose the Hellions. Um, so it would just make your life easier at all around, all around purposes of getting developing your early game, basically. And yeah, I think that'll help a lot. Yep, and uh, how many roaches should they build? Uh, about eight. Example, like, eight? if it, yeah, eight is like a standard number where if it's like a Hellion opener and you are you just want to make sure you don't get screwed at all, eight would be great at dealing with any type of harass. If it's, an, if it's a very aggressive, like, Marauder Hellbat opener like this was, start with eight, and then I would say you can make more during the fight if you're not feeling confident that you're going to win that fight. So the long, like and the, the reason why that, that I say it kind of open ended that way is because not every Terran has to do a Hellbat timing at the exact same time. What if he pushes you with six Hellbats and two Marauders? What if he waits and pushes you with eight Hellbats and three Marauders? 
What if he waits and pushes you with ten Hellbats and four Marauders? Like, you do, like, people do weird shit sometimes. So if you're not feeling confident, you're like, that's kind of a big army. Feel free to make more Roaches to make sure you're okay. But just try to never put yourself in a situation where you're like that guy who's making 35 Roaches against six Hellbats and two Marauder. And you're just worried as fuck. Like, try, like and that, that comes from scouting, right? So just try to be more active with scouting so you can give yourself a good answer here to like your question of what do I need but eight is generally what you need you'll be fine and make more accordingly if you feel pressured just be very fast about your drone windows so if you kill an army be very liberal and fast about droning as quick as you can and injecting your bases and making sure you saturate that sweet spot drone count where it's like if you're two base, if you have three bases and your third base has like, you know, four drones on it, for instance, and you've made eight roaches and he shows up and attacks you, you kill his army. All of it dies. You lose like five roaches. He loses everything. Be like, all right, I have a moment here because he lost his whole push where I can drone up my third super fast. And now, and then as soon as my third saturated, I can go right back, shift gears right back into making whatever I need. And that could be, do I want to make Ling Bane because I scouted for bio? Or I scouted mech and I should make more roaches. For now. Like, make sure you're fast at doing those things. That is going to 100% make the pace of your game good or bad. Good. Noted. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Alright, man. Well, uh... Our... <clears throat> I would say... Do you have any questions about anything uh, efficiency-wise about things we can talk about that you're not sure of, or how you feeling? Mm, currently, no. I asked everything I had. Okay. <clears throat> well, I guess we are. I guess we're good. Um, yep. All right, Manuel. I if you have another question, you, like if something pops up, you, like if you're like. Vibe, I'm not sure what gas count I want to be at or whatever. You can feel free to send me a message on Discord. Uh, but I otherwise, I'll talk to you again next month probably. And uh, yep. Good luck to you, dude. I hope it helps. And uh, thanks for doing another lesson. And I, I appreciate it, dude. Yeah, me too, man. Bye bye and battle cruiser operation. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I was hoping bye you'd bye. say it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take it easy, man. All right, guys, that's been another coaching lesson uh, with IFAC. IFAC. Much love. Uh, if you guys enjoyed it, you guys can check out more coaching lessons that I do on uh, on my channel on YouTube. I have posted a ton of them, so go check them out if you're interested. And thanks for watching, everybody. Until the next one, good luck to yourselves, and uh, go win some ladder games, guys. See you next time.